Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Dave Thompson. I ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the potential environmental impact of the Cromarty Firth Port Authority's application for ship-to-ship -ship oil transfer in the Cromarty Firth is granted. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. As the Member will be aware, many concerns have been expressed on the current application regarding the potential impact on our marine environment. He may also be aware that a few years ago, when a similar application was made elsewhere in Scottish waters, the then Environment Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, wrote to the Secretary of State for Transport in the UK Government, seeking greater powers for the Scottish Government in this reserved matter. Unfortunately, that request was declined. However, I have written again this week to make the same request. I have also made it clear to the Secretary of State that the Scottish Government expects to be fully consulted prior to a final decision being taken on the application. Dave Thompson. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that uh, the Cabinet Secretary has written again and that he's asked that the Scottish Government be fully consulted in relation to this matter before a decision is taken. There's huge concern in my constituency and neighbouring constituencies, that of Rob Gibson, uh, to the north of the, the Firth in relation to this matter. And I worry that the MCA will just follow a process and automatically grant a licence if the main sort of conditions are agreed to. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could elaborate a wee bit more on what pressure he is prepared to put on the UK Government to devolve this power to us and deal with this matter. Cabinet Secretary. I can assure Dave Thompson and other members I will continue to apply that pressure at the very least Absolutely, the Scottish Government should be involved uh, in the decision-making process. I can also inform the Chamber that our advisers, Scottish National Heritage, have submitted to the consultation as a statutory consultee, and I now have a copy of their submission. They indicate they disagree with the conclusion of the environmental statement about the residual likely significant impact and effect on European designated sites. They advise the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency as a competent authority in this matter to carry out an appropriate assessment. They believe that mitigation can reduce but not eliminate the risks to the integrity of several designated interests. And they also say it is not possible to conclude no adverse effect on the site integrity in relation to the Murray Firth Special Area Conservation. Of course, the SEC is for bottlenose dolphins. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary is aware that this consultation has been ongoing for months. There is great concern, as has been highlighted by my colleague Dave Thompson, yet there has been utter silence from the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs. Would you wish to reflect on whether uh, it was wise to wait till after the consultation before expressing a view? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is only right that the Cromarty First should carry out their consultation in what is about extending an existing activity. Uh, what I said publicly in the last few weeks is that we would await the advice from our own advisers, who in turn are statutory consultees for the application that went through the, the consultation. But now the consultation has closed, and now I am aware of the views of Scottish Natural Heritage and other advisers. As you can imagine, I am very concerned by what I am learning, and I am taking a very close interest in what now happens uh, in response to the consultation outcome. This is a reserved matter. Uh, and whilst unlike the situation in fourth ports a few years ago where a different type of oil was being proposed and different uh, circumstances applied, there are still very real concerns in terms of the Cromarty Firth application and the potential impact on the marine environment. And that is why we will take a very close interest in this issue, make our vote, views known both to the Cromarty Firth uh, Authority and also the UK Government. Question number two, Alex Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to address the reported shortage of GPs in rural areas. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Ministers are fully committed to supporting primary care, including GPs, and ensuring that all communities in Scotland, including remote and rural, receive safe, reliable and sustainable health care services. Over the next three years, the Scottish Government will invest £85 million as part of the Primary Care Fund. As part of this, £2.5 million will be invested to, in work to explore with key stakeholders the issues surrounding GP recruitment and retention, which can be particularly challenging in remote and rural areas. Alex Ferguson. I am grateful for that response, but in Dumfries and Galloway there are currently 14 GP vacancies, soon to go up to 16, with two impending retirements. Only four out of 12 training scheme places were taken up 
this year. 25% of GPs are over 55, and they do not appear to be persuaded to continue working past retirement by the government's proposed contract. So why is it that since this government came to power, the proportion of the NHS budget allocated to GPs has reduced from 9.8% in 2005-06 to 7.4% in 2014-15? What actions will the government take now to address the decline within the NHS budget in order to make um, general practice more attractive to young doctors and encourage older practitioners to remain in practice? Cabinet Secretary. Well, under this government, the number of GPs employed in Scotland has risen by 7% to nearly 5,000. And of course, we recently announced an extra 100 extra uh, training places. But I accept that there is more to be done. And that's why, of course, we are in the midst of negotiating a new contract. So there's not a new contract there for GPs to reject or otherwise, because we've only just began to negotiate it with the BMA. Hopefully the member will appreciate that. But this new model, if we get it right, a new contract has the potential to del deliver Sir Lewis Ritchie's vision for primary care, which is one based on a multidisciplinary team, everybody working to the top of their skill level, freeing up GPs to be able to spend more time with those more complex cases. That's what we want to deliver. And and we will commit to more GPs to deliver that model. Um, of course, we've already said that. So I hope the member will appreciate the, that we are doing a whole range of things that are going to be important in delivering a very good uh, future for GPs in Scotland. And if I can just end by saying that uh, I would hope that through the junior doctor recruitment, uh, which of course is operating over the next month, that we will see a lot of junior doctors wanting to come to Scotland and wanting to train in general practice here in Scotland, because it's a great opportunity for them. Question number three, Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer. May I ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to review the personal foot care guidance? Minister Maureen Mott. The National Personal Foot Care Guidance was launched in September 2013 and we have no plans to review it at this time. Bruce Smith. Can I thank uh, the Minister for that answer? She may be aware that my colleague Patricia Ferguson recently raised concerns with the Cabinet Secretary about the podiatry service offered by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And while I don't want to go into individual cases, presiding officer, I do have examples of elderly and blind constituents being told to cut uh, their own nails. But my concern really is about the volume of complaints we're receiving about this service. Can I ask the minister that she seeks st statistics uh, from the board on the number of users being turned away from a service they previously accessed uh, uh, in order to assure ourselves that this upturn in complaints is not actually a result of attempts to reduce costs? And if she does believe... Uh, sorry, President Officer, if she does believe that the guidance has been followed appropriately, um, then I would urge, urge her to consider whether or not the, uh, there are unintended consequences flowing uh, from the guidance that was issued in 2013. Minister. Um, uh, I thank the, the member for his supplementary question, of, and I'm happy to look into uh, the figures uh, at, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. But uh, personal care is available to anyone without charge for those people over 65 who have been assessed by the local authority as needing it. And the legislation includes keeping fingernails and toenails trimmed as one of the aspects of uh, personal care, but that needn't necessarily be carried out by a podi podiatrist. And detailed information is available from N NHS health boards and from NHS Inform as to how one can look after one's own feet or have someone else look after them. Question number four, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it is having with the UK Government regarding the proposed referendum on EU membership. Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop. Uh, although the Scottish Government was not consulted on the UK Government's proposals, I last spoke to Minister for Europe David Lennington on the 2nd of February and received an update on the Tusk letter and the UK Government's position. The Scottish Government believes that continued European Union membership is overwhelmingly in Scotland's best interests, which is why we are making a positive constructive case for staying in the EU. And it is essential to ensure voters are fully informed of the arguments of EU membership. And as such, the Scottish Government is strongly opposed to a June referendum, as has been suggested. Uh, given a June date would also cut across election campaigns for the Scottish Parliament and other devolved administrations, the First Ministers of the devolved administrations wrote a joint letter to the Prime Minister of the, uh, on the 3rd of February urging him to defer a referendum to ensure a debate free from other campaigning distractions. 
Roderick Campbell. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. One of the threads of the UK Government's negotiating position is to give greater powers to national parliaments to block or scrap EU legislation. My understanding is that the UK Government have been exploring the possibility of a sovereignty bill to enshrine that, according to the Sunday Times, either in a British Bill of Rights or another bill. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns about the implications for Scotland, and will she seek urgent clarification of the UK Government's intentions in that respect? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, indeed, we share uh, the Member's concerns, and Alec Neil and Michael Matheson from their respective portfolios uh, are seeking urgent clarification from the UK Government in relation to any proposals for a British Bill of Rights. We will stand firm uh, in our position that we do not want to see a diminution of any human rights uh, across these aisles, but also we need to respect the sovereignty of this place and of the people of Scotland. And in relation to the issue of the so-called red card, I think it should be interesting to point out in terms of sovereignty that the red car card is meant to allow groups of national parliaments to block EU legislation. But it's worth noting, presiding officer, that the, the existing yellow card procedure, which is a far lower threshold than that proposed by the red card, has only ever been used twice since 2009, and the orange card has never been used before. Question number five, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Ministers and government officials meet regularly with re representatives of all health boards, including NHS Lanarkshire. Uh, Fabiani. Thank you. May I ask um, the Cabinet Secretary at the last meeting whether the out of hours service in East Cobride was discussed and when the residents of the town can expect an update on the current interim situation? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, um, as Linda Fabiani knows, the recommended interim model um, to, uh, the NHS Lanarkshire has introduced uh, in the short term uh, is giving them an opportunity uh, to develop a longer term solution around a broader range of out of hours proposals including those for the East Kilbride area and those longer long term proposals must be developed as I have made clear to NHS Lanarkshire in consultation with staff and the public and have to be completely in line with the outcome of the national review of out of our services uh, published at the end of November. Uh, I understand that NHS Lanarkshire are intending to involve Sir Lewis Ritchie uh, in those uh, proposals and discussions in taking this forward to ensure that what they are looking at is very much in line with uh, the national recommendations. I'm very happy to write to Linda Fabiani and give her a further update in due course. Question number six, Claudia Beamish. Reason it has reduced the climate change budget. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, uh, within relevant portfolios, including support for renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable travel, waste reduction, and natural carbon capture through forestry and peatland restoration. The reductions are predominantly in the energy budget, and it is widely recognised that the UK government is hampering the renewable energy sector and putting at risk millions of pounds of investment in the Scottish and UK economies. If the UK government had kept its previous commitments, the viability of many projects would not now be in question and Scottish government support would have been maintained. In addition, the axing by the UK government of its Green Deal Home Improvement Fund led directly to Scotland losing £15 million in ring fence consequentials that supported our Home Energy Efficiency Programme cashback scheme. But despite the raft of UK regulatory and policy changes in energy and energy efficiency, we have increased our climate change budget across other areas by £13.3 million. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for that answer. And uh, it's disappointing to hear the blame being passed to the UK Government when these are issues that are priorities that can be made by the Scottish Government. Agriculture, for instance, accounts for a significant proportion of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's again disappointing to see a reduction in the rural land use budget. And I'd like to ask the Minister how this will affect the emissions. And further, um, after the failure to meet the climate change emissions this year again, what engagement has there been across portfolios in the Scottish Government Climate Change Subcommittee uh, in relation to the draft budget and climate change. Minister. Well, can I say to uh, Claudia Beamer that the challenge that we have is this Parliament doesn't have all the levers that it needs, not least in the crucial area of energy policy, where we need the UK Government to assist Scotland's drive to develop renewables and carbon capture and storage, not stymie it as they have done so uh, recently. 
Uh, we are developing a third report on policies and proposals, and that will contain an assessment of the progress towards implementing policies and proposals that have been set out in the RPP2, and it will include any adjustments the Scottish Ministers consider are required. It is our aim, wherever possible, to overachieve against our future annual targets to recover uh, the difference by which the earlier targets were missed. And the RPP3 will also set out proposals and policies to compensate in future years for the excess emissions from previous annual targets. Question number seven, Alison Johnson. what its position is on extending train services between Edinburgh and Glasgow later into the evening. Minister Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government, as part of the ScotRail franchise agreement, specify later evening services to be provided to cater for special and big events across the network, including in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Alison Johnson. I, I welcome the improvements to the line and I welcome the, the Minister's assurance that this will happen when, when bigger events are on. But it really is important that people have reliable, frequent transport options, enabling them to get home, not only after attending events and gigs in the city, but enjoying an evening that perhaps goes on far into the evening. The Minister knows, of course, that Glasgow is now home to the third biggest venue in the world. But there would be many benefits to introducing a later tra train service where the conditions are agreed by staff and unions on an ongoing basis and it would benefit towns like Linlithgow in between. Will the Minister look into maximising the potential of the improvements to this line? Minister. I think Alison Johnston raises a very valid point and previously there were studies into the cost benefit um, analysis and outputs of, of such uh, an investment. It is something I'm happy to look at again, as well as a substantial multi-million pound investment in infrastructure track and rolling stock, but what further improvements can be made around maximising that rolling stock to, to suit the timetable and see what further support we can bring in terms of economic uh, growth. Question number eight, David Torrens. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting local organisations that raise awareness for issues surrounding mental health. Minister Jimmy Hepburn. Mental health is an absolute priority for the Scottish Government and we continue to work closely with our partners, including the National Health Service, local authorities, the third sector, service users and carers to ensure we offer the best quality of life and opportunities for all people with mental health problems. The Scottish Government funds CME, the Scottish Association for Mental Health, Voices of Experience, Scottish Recovery Network and NHS Health Scotland, who all work with local organisations to raise awareness of mental health issues. Last year, we announced additional investment of £100 million to improve mental health services over five years. The draft budget for 2016-17 provides a further £50 million, resulting in a total package of £150 million to 2019-20. David Torrens. I thank the Minister for his answer. Staff members of Penumbra Fife Youth Project, an organisation that works in every high school in Fife, are now on 90 days' notice as Fife Council have cut their funding without prior consultation of service users, which will, have a service impact on crucial, which will have a severe impact on crucial services they provide. Would the Minister agree that early intervention is an important mechanism to prevent mental health problems and helps young people who are at risk to focus on positive outcomes? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. This is uh, an important uh, question, not just uh, locally for uh, Mr Torrance, uh, but also because this is uh, Children's Mental Health Week. I would certainly agree with Mr Torrance that early intervention uh, with uh, youngsters in particular is uh, crucial. I would also uh, concur that Penumbra are a, a great organisation. Uh, I am aware of the situation. Five Penumbra have not approached me uh, directly on relation to this matter. As uh, Mr Torrance sets out, this is uh, a decision uh, for uh, Fife Council, but I would uh, certainly expect uh, Fife Council to have considered the impact that any closure may have on young people and have plans in place to mitigate any adverse effects. Question nine, Gil Patterson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what impact the closure of the, the Glasgow Queen Street Tunnel will have on commuters in the Clydebank and Mogai constituency. Minister Derek McCann. The ScotRail Alliance have developed a temporary timetable for the Queen Street Tunnel closure, which minimises the impact on all commuters and allows the vast majority of customers to continue to travel to and from Glasgow by train. Four services will continue to operate each hour from Mogai to Glasgow, and customers using Clydebank will experience a reduced service from four to two trains per hour. During the tunnel closure, there will be 12 trains each hour connecting the west of the city with Glasgow Queen Street low level and Glasgow Central low level. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Minister for that, for that reply? 
With the upgrading works taking place uh, at Queen Street to enhance our railways, I wondered if the Minister will, will, after the works are carried out, look at the possibility of a feasibility study for a rail halt uh, at the Allender to increase capacity, which would be located on the branch line between Hillfoot and Mulgay. Minister. I understand that the Council is carrying out an appraisal of this in line with our guidance. I am happy to look at that and give it due consideration through, for example, the Scottish Stations Fund. Thank you. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery Her Excellency Paivi Luce Terinen, the Ambassador of Finland to the United Kingdom. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question